All right. So in Second Chronicles chapter five, 25, we're going to be spending most of the time in this chapter this morning. Um, I, I found this, this story kind of interesting. Obviously, there's, a, there's this big story going on with Amaziah and um, how he did things that were right according to God, but not with his whole heart because later on he ends up serving God. It, it, it's, it always blows my mind when I read this. He hears from the man of God because he at first he's, he's planning his war, right, to go to war with the Edomites. Edomites are the sons of Esau, okay, and they're, you know, they're in, they have their own land. So he's going to war against the Edomites. He's got 300,000 soldiers, and he's going to hire another 100,000 from Israel. This is, the, Amaziah was a king of Judah. Judah was the southern kingdom, and the whole rest of Israel, you know, this is after they got separated. There's two kingdoms. You have Israel and Judah. So Amaziah is the king of Judah. He's got 300,000 warriors, and he's thinking, you know what? We probably need some more in order to, to take on this battle. So he hires another 100,000. Well, the man of God comes, and he tells them, look, you know, they're not right with God. I don't want you to, to you, you know, you ought not to be using these people. You have nothing to do with them. Don't be yoking up with them. Don't be hiring them even to be your soldiers in this war. He's saying, if you want to do basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, if you want to be right with God, if you want to do right by God in God's eyes, you should just not have anything to do with them. So he listens to his advice and then he goes out and he wins the battle. He just defeats the Edomites. And <laughs> he gets, he takes the advice from the Lord, but then he turns around and he brings their gods back and sets them up. It's like, it even says, you know, they weren't, you know, these gods weren't able to save them from you. What are you doing worship, worshiping them now? It, you know, it's, it, it blows my mind every time I read this, the, the, the lack of thought that goes into this. How in the world are you going to worship these false gods that aren't even able to save or protect when you were following the right God and he did right by, and, and you won the battle because of that, because of your obedience to the word. And now you're just turning around right away and, and, and worshiping these false idols. Now, I, I, because that was part of the chapter, I, I just like mentioning that because to me it's just something that stands out a lot. But we're going to be spending our time looking at the, the aspect here of when the man of God comes unto him. Look at verse number 7. It says, But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to wit with all the children of Ephraim. Now Ephraim geographically was a lot closer to Judah. So it would make sense. And Ephraim was also a very large tribe. So it seems to me that he's hiring, you know, these 100,000 soldiers out of Ephraim. And the man of God is telling him, look, don't let these soldiers that you've hired go with you. Now think about this from Amaziah's standpoint. This is a big deal. He hired 100,000 and he had 300,000. That's one fourth of his force. 25% of his entire army now, he's being asked to just say, yeah, don't, don't bring those with you. 100,000 soldiers, that's a lot of people. That's going to be a big impact on the war, right, on his battle. So just worldly speaking, if you were, when you're planning something, you're going to go fight with somebody else. Not being able to bring 100,000 troops with you is huge. So what he's asking him to do here is a big deal. This isn't just something that, that's real flippant. You know, oftentimes we could say, it's easy on the sidelines to say, well, of course you have to listen to God in every single instance. And that is true. Absolutely. When God says, you know, we ought to be able to just, just immediately just obey God without question. But you have to put yourself in the situation because this is real life. And, and it's easy to look at these types of things and then become hypocrites in our own life because we end up making justifications for our own sins. You read the Bible and be like, oh yeah, of course, he's got to listen to God. But then when it comes to you, you know, what are you doing? You start thinking that, oh, well, well, what I'm doing actually is okay because this, this, and this, right? And we start to make up excuses. We're going to get into that a little bit uh, this morning. But we see him here. He's got, he's got a big decision to make. He hears the word of God. This is a man of God coming to him saying, look, Israel is not right with God. These children of Ephraim, they are wicked. They have forsaken God and you should have nothing to do with them. Now, as a side note, I think there's something we could learn here in a principle that can be used even today. And, I, and would to God it would be used within our own government, within our own um, society, within our, within our own you know, policy makers as far as supporting people militarily. 
Right now, we live in a nation where all the politicians are lining up. If you want to be the next elected politician, you have to bow down and go kiss the wall in Israel and say, I stand with Israel and I'm going to, you know, we're going to defend them to the end and all this other stuff. Look, they're godless. Amen. They have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not believers. They are not, they're not good people. Okay, in the sense that you know, it's not a Christian nation. These aren't people that we need to be supporting and doing all this other stuff with. Like, I don't, the, and, the, and the whole bunch of them is like, oh, I'm not saying that, oh, well, Syria is so much better or, or any of these other countries. Look, Iran, Iraq, look, they're all godless. Yep. None of them are following the Lord Jesus Christ. We should not be getting yoked up with these people and serving. I mean, this is, this is what came from the, the man of God saying that, the Lord is not with Israel. And I'll tell you, I got news for you today. The Lord is not with the Israel of today either. Amen. He's not with them. So what are we doing getting involved in their efforts or you know, using their troops or going and supporting them and supplying missiles and bombs and guns and troops and everything else to support the military? We should have nothing to do with it. And this is consistent throughout the Bible. By the way, this is not the only place you'll find uh, uh, this type of thing being said about Israel. Anytime Israel's being wicked... You know, the King Jehoshaphat was another great example. At the time of King Jehoshaphat, he was a king of Judah. There was King Ahab in Israel. And King Jehoshaphat went, you know, Ahab called on him. He's saying, hey, help us out. We need your help. So he goes and he's saying, yeah, you know, my people are thy people. You will help you out. We're there for you, brother. We're going we're gonna to do whatever it takes to help you and support you. So he does that. He goes out military, he returns home. Another man of God approaches him. He's saying, shouldest thou help the ungodly? He's saying, what are you doing? You know, you're going to bring a curse on yourself now because you're going out and helping a wicked people. And this is something that we, you know, our country, our nation should take to heart. You know, if you really, truly, and, and this is, there's so many Christians that are deceived by this today. They think they're actually doing right by God's word in, in showing support for this nation of Israel. They're saying, oh, this is God's chosen people. And, you know, God's going to bless us because we're blessing Israel. That's false. Amen. If that were true, and, and you know what's so funny about this is this is even in the Old Testament, and he's saying, don't bless Israel. Don't do good things for them. So if this was the case in the Old Testament, right after these, you know, when that, you know, supposedly that, that's that blanket statement that people like to throw out there is that was actually given to Abraham. He says, I will bless them that bless thee, singular to one person, Abraham, and not to the whole nation of Israel, but people, you know, pastors today will, will take that and run with it and just say, see, I'll bless them that bless thee, so we need to bless Israel. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense. But as you see this too, if you even wanted to continue on with that and say, you know what, this can apply to the nation of Israel. Okay, but it better only be when they're turned back to God, when they're serving the Lord. If you want to make that case, fine. But it better, it better follow along with the Bible way of them turning back unto God. And, receive, now, and I don't believe that anyways. I think they've been replaced. Because they, they, when Jesus Christ came unto his own, his own rejected him. Mm -hmm. They received him not. And, and they have been replaced. They've been cut off and they've been replaced with a nation that will bring forth the fruits thereof. That's what the Bible says. So I don't think it applies at all. But if you still want to say that applies, well then, you better be doing it when they actually turn back to the Lord. Because right now, they're not turned to the Lord. And all throughout history in the Bible that we see biblical history, God is saying, no, don't help the ungodly. Even if it's his children, his people, Israel, don't help them when they're turned back from the Lord and they're serving other gods, which Judaism of today is serving a false god. It's not the Lord from the Bible. No matter how much they want to say it is, it's not. Because if they would believe God, they'd believe the Son. You can't have the Father without the Son. You have to, you have, to have them both because they are, they are one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> but that's just kind of a side note there I wanted to point out, because this is what, exactly what's happening. Amaziah is being told, don't use these people. You know, they're, they're wicked. Don't have anything to do with them. So as he's considering this in his mind, he's trying to make this decision. It comes up to his head, and his head, he thinks about, well, wait a minute. We've already hired these guys. We've already paid 100 talents of silver. And that's a lot of money. Like, I don't know the exact equivalent of that, but when you look up, like, even a talent, you know, you, you, you think about shekels are like uh, um, 
Even a shekel is kind of a lot of money. The, in the Bible, a penny was a day's wages. And then you go up from there and you have, you have shekels and you have these, these different units of measurement and a talent was, was kind of a lot. So he pays like a hundred talents of silver, which uh, is, is, a, is a significant amount of money because he's starting to think, well, wait a minute now. You want me not to use these people, but I've already paid them. You know, they're already conscribed to, to do this work for me. What about this hundred talents of silver? What are we going to do about that? And look at the answer. It says... Um, Well, first he says, in verse, look at verse 8. He says, but if thou wilt go, because first he tells them, and, and I got a little bit ahead of myself. First he tells them, don't use the children of Israel. But then he says in verse 8, but if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. Say, you know what, though? If you want to do this, fine, go ahead and do it. Be strong. Go ahead. Be, you know, use your, your might as much as possible. God's able to cast you down. It doesn't matter if you have a million troops out there. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have troops as the sand by the sea. Because that's happened. And it's been recorded that there have been troops that have come up against Israel when they were serving the Lord and they defeated them because God was fighting for them. And he said, if you're going to go against God now, if you're going to go against his commandment, God's going to be against you. And it doesn't matter how many troops you have. God's able to cast you down. He says, for God has power to help and to cast down. So if you're going to obey and do what's right, Hey, you could have a hundred troops and God will defeat the enemy for you because God is able to help if that's what he wants. But he's telling you, don't use these people. Obey him. Hey, he's able to help. If you disobey him, he's going to cast you down. And then he says in verse 9, he says, And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents? He said, Well, what are we going to do about this? We, we already paid him. He says, which I have given to the army of Israel. And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. He said, don't worry about the money. The money means nothing. Hey, God is able to bless you way more abundantly than that. Don't even let the money be a thought. Don't even let that be a consideration. Now, we all too often have these kinds of thoughts when we're considering getting sin out of our life. Let's make the application because, you know, none of us are going to be faced with this, with this same exact dilemma that Amaziah had as being the king and sending armies, you know, an army off to war. We're not in the same exact situation. But we are faced with similar situations when we are confronted with the word of God in our life. When we're confronted with what is right, what is the right thing to do, and we have to decide, am I going to do what's right? Am I going to listen to God's word? Now look, it's going to come at a cost. Often, especially if you're already in sin and you see something from the Bible and you need to get that sound up, it's going to cost you. And that's the, the, the title of my sermon this morning is The Cost of Being Right with God. There is a cost associated with that. We need to be able to accept God's word and not worry about the cost and just be able to accept it. Um, because it, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say... Let's say you're, you're kind of a new Christian, you're a younger Christian, and you're reading through your Bible, and you get to the book of Proverbs, and you read in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And you look at that verse, and you go, wow, this is pretty strong about alcohol. And then you get to Proverbs 23, that goes on further about the, about the effects of alcohol, and, and say, you know, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it moves itself in the cup, when it gives its color. You know, it, it, you start reading these verses about wine and strong drink, and you start, and, and you know, maybe you just went out and bought a case of wine. And you just spent all this money. You spent hundreds of dollars on this booze and this alcohol. You just stocked your bar or your whatever you have. What are you going to do? You see it plainly in the Word of God. He's saying, you know what? This is a sin. This is something I shouldn't be partaking in at all, but I just invested all of this money into this. What, what about the hundreds of dollars I just spent? What about that? Well, we need to be able to take that same attitude and say, look, God is able to cover all that. Look, God is going to be way more pleased. You need to just get rid of that stuff, dump it, destroy it, you know, pour it down the sink and get it out of your house. Because the money means nothing. God's able to restore that money back to you. Look, and, and the, I always look at it like this. If, if you're going in, you know, you spend money on something, you realize I shouldn't have done that at all, but you could still back out of it. Hey, 
That's just the price of the lesson that you just learned. You know what I mean? If it's a few hundred dollars, so be it. That lesson, though, if you can, if you can stick with that, will save you way more in the end. I mean, something like alcohol, especially. I mean, you spend a few hundred dollars. I can't even tell you how much money I've wasted on alcohol over the years. But you know what? When I got right with God, I'm not wasting another dime on that for the rest of my life. As opposed to if I would just continue down that path, it's just, just throwing more and more and more money away. I could have said, no, I, but I, I'm just going to drink the rest of this and then be done with it. Mm -hmm. Look, God has the power to help and God has the power to cast down. And if you want, especially if you have a problem with alcohol, look, you want God to help you. Amen. You want God to be there to, to help you out. You need to just be able to recognize this is the word of God. I'm going to just, just get rid of all the stuff and forsake it. Another example, maybe you just bought um, the entire Seinfeld collection on DVD, right? And I had this. I owned it. Okay, this is something that, that, you know, this is something that happened to me personally. And then the first episode you pop in, they say something blasphemous about the Lord Jesus Christ. Or they're using very inappropriate humor that you know you shouldn't even be listening to this. And that this is corrupt communication that you're not supposed to be listening to. Or, or, you know, or they're blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you going to do? Are you just going to ignore that and just keep going on and say, yeah, but it's funny. Yeah, but I just want, I mean, that's just this one part. The rest of it's fine. Look, it's garbage. Yes. And it needs to be treated as such and put into the trash can. Or maybe turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Keep your finger here in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 25. Flip back real quick to Deuteronomy 22. We all have different sins. And, you know, it, it may not be Seinfeld. It may not be alcohol. It may not be any of these things. But look, there's something in our life, because I know none of us are perfect. And there's something that when we see just written point blank in the Bible... You have to make that decision and realize that God has the power to help and God has the power to cast down. And if we're going to ignore and, and not listen to what God says, he's not going to be helping you. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5. These are, these are just some common problems that a lot of people might have and that, and that tend to press buttons and get people real angry. Okay, because they because they love whatever it is, you know, whatever it is. I love my alcohol. I love I love my DVDs. I love my movies. I love I love my music. I love, you know, whatever. Deuteronomy 20. And I'm just showing you some of these verses because this is written in the Bible and we and we ought to take it seriously. Deuteronomy 22, verse five, it says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, I'm not going to spend the whole sermon Going into this, I've done this in the past, but the Bible's saying, look, there are clo there's clothing that belongs to men and there's clothing that belongs to women. And if you start going into to the other's realm, it's an abomination unto God. God hates that. Amen. He hates that. It's an abomination. This tends to be more of a problem with women than men these days just because of the way the culture has been pushing the feminist movement and trying to make females feel like they need to be more like men in order to be valued. Right. That is ultimately what's behind this feminist movement. It's not embracing femininity. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is being feminine? I think everybody should have a good concept of being feminine and what that means. Even in today's culture, just the word feminine, you think of someone who's soft, nurturing, you know, meek, you know, loving. These are all things that are feminine qualities. Obviously, loving, you, you know, you'd be a man and be loving too. But you know where I'm going at with, with a feminine. And you know, when you run across a guy that's feminine, you know. Mm -hmm. You say, they're acting feminine. They're acting like a girl. Yeah. Okay? But here's the thing. For women, being feminine is a great thing because that's how God made you. He made you to be feminine. He made you to be soft. He didn't make you to go out and do all this backbreaking labor that the man's supposed to be doing. He didn't, you know, that's why he made men physically stronger than women. There's certain qualities and attributes that God has given you to fulfill your role and your job. And it's of high price and of high value in God's eyes. And it ought to be in ours as well. But see, today's society is telling you, no, 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 no. 
Unless the woman could go and be the CEO. Unless the woman can go and, and you know, fight in our wars. Unless the woman can go and do all these other things, then, then you're just being a sexist and, and you're trying to oppress women. Look, I'm not oppressing women because I don't want them fighting my battles for me. Because I'm not sending them out to war to fight against other men and, and have atrocities happen to them. Look, we protect our women because we love them. And the men go out and fight because they're stronger. And because that's what God has built them to do, not the woman. And this, this, this topic of, of wearing different clothing, look, God has made us very different. Someone being masculine versus someone being feminine is, is two opposites. They're completely different. And God made us that way, and God wants it that way. So in all aspects, when it comes down to even what we wear, and as we're going to get into in a minute, our, our, the way we look, even our hairstyles, okay? God made men and women to be different. So when the Bible says a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, there is clothing that is considered men's clothing. Now look, you can go through this all day long, and I've heard people try to argue and say, well, you know what, these are women's pants. And these are, you know, it's like, what's the difference really? Yep. One's just a little bit tighter than the other. Look, and, and I'm not going to spend all, if you, want, if you want to know more about this topic specifically, I believe it's a sin for women to wear pants. Mm -hmm. I don't think they should ever be wearing pants because I believe that is a garment that is historically all throughout time been associated with men. I believe it's men's clothing. Okay. And women should be wearing skirts, dresses, that type of thing. And that men shouldn't be wearing those things. Amen. Because those have historically always been women's clothing. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure this out. But if you want to know more about this, talk to me after the service. I will give you sermons that where I completely outline, you know, through the history. You know, it, it should tell you just one thing, that the man who is responsible in our modern society for putting women, he's, he's branded and known as putting women in pants as a sodomite. He's a fashion designer. And I don't know the, the, the guy's name, but he's a fashion designer from, from you know, 50, 60 years ago, 70 years, I don't, I don't remember how long ago it was, but even in American culture, it was looked down upon for women to, to be wearing pants because that's not what women wear. Our culture even said back then that this would, you know, that, that was abnormal. And it was, it was socially unacceptable until the movie started coming out and they started putting these images up of these beautiful actresses and wearing things like that, and, and it, it changed the way society thought. And um, anyways, I don't want to get all into that. You know, so what you hear, maybe you hear something preach about that and you're convinced, okay? And you say, you know what, this is right, but I just bought a whole new wardrobe. Mm -hmm. What am I gonna do with this stuff? You know, you start thinking of that money, that financial investment you just made in it. Look, get rid of it. You want to get right with God? Just get rid of it. On the flip side, as I was mentioning with the, with the differences between men and women, maybe you're a man. Maybe you're a man who's never had a haircut and your parents, you know, they thought it was real cool to give you this ponytail and you have this long hair is growing. You say you've never had a haircut since birth. And be like, man, but it's, but, you know, there's all this time is invested. You know, I'm 30 years old and, I, and I've never had this haircut. How can I possibly do it? Well, look, when the Bible says, doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair is a shame unto him? Well, you read that in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you read that. It doesn't matter how much you've invested in this thing. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's a sin, it's a sin. We need to just be able to obey God and just say, you know what? I'm willing to give up whatever it is I've invested into this just so I can be right with God. Whether it's finances, money, you know, I bought all those booze, or whether it's time you know, invested in, in, in your hair, whatever. As, you know, as a man, look, if you have long hair, it's a shame unto you. Shame on you if you're a man with long hair. That's what the Bible's saying. It says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And again, I preach an entire sermon on 1 Corinthians 11 that goes through just the length of our hair. And does God feel that that's important for our lives? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Maybe you realize that, that your favorite band is actually satanic, right? You listen to, to some rock music or whatever, and you find out, wow, these guys are actually really bad. You actually listen to their lyrics, and you hear what they're saying, and it's blasphemous against the Lord. But maybe you just bought this extremely rare, you know, bootleg of their first concert and all this other, you know, you spent, you're like, this is worth so much money. It's trash. Amen. 
I'll tell you what I did. When I started to get right with God, look, I was into all, you know, I don't want to say all these things because I, <laughs> I was never into cross-dressing, but when <laughs> these things with, um, when you start getting right with God, right? Music, movies, all these different things that you start to realize, man, this is actually really bad. This is programming me in a bad way. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be letting all this come into myself because it's affecting me, it's influencing me. And I would always notice when I would listen to this music and really get into this movies that it wasn't just that sin. I'd, I'd start, it would start impacting my life in other areas. When I was struggling with other sins, the more I was listening to the worldly music and the, and the godless music, the more I would be likely and tempted to go do other sins. And it's just the way, you know, it's sin, it's all kind of built upon each other. Now, um, what I did was I took, because I here's, here's, you have choices to make, right? You could say, well, I invested all this money into my CD collection. So I'm going to get some of that back. I'm not going to listen to it anymore, but I'm going to go off and sell it. Now, that's not what I did. And I'll tell you why. Because if I believe that this stuff is wicked, which I did, I believe it's very subtle and it's very wicked and it turns people into doing a lot, of, a lot of sinful things and that it's not something that anybody should be listening to. And because I believe that, you know what? The money didn't matter. I, don't, I couldn't tell you how much money I invested in my movie collection, in my music collection, and things like that. But when I saw something, I said, you know what? This is wicked. I basically stamped it to powder. I destroyed it so that nobody's going to be able to listen to it. Nobody's going to be able to use it. And that's the way sometimes we come across things or we receive things. You know, people give us presents. They don't, they don't always know like what our beliefs are on something or whatever. And they're just trying to be nice. But it's like when we get like girls pants, we don't, we don't, you know, we just get rid of them. We just, we, just, we just toss it because it's like if it's not right, it's not right. I'm not going to be helping other people to sin. I don't want that for anybody. Now, you make your own decision for yourself, fine, you know, do what well, that's between you and God, but I'm not going to be a helper in doing that. I'm not going to be selling someone else what I see to be sinful things. I mean, if I had this false God or false idol, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, hey, you worship this God? Here, let me sell this to you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, you shouldn't be worshiping this false God. Look, this is what we do to this and break it into powder and, and be done with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> If you want to do what's right, it's going to have to come at some kind of cost. Now, it really shouldn't even be a consideration. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we ought to be able to take these things and hopefully your heart is at the point and it's right with God to where you can just be able to part with anything. If you find something in your life, whatever that may be, doesn't matter, whatever that may be, and you realize, you know, you could be ignorant about something, for a while, and then, and then you finally come across this, and you say, wow, I didn't know that. We ought to be able to not even consider, well, this cost me X amount of dollars, this cost me what, you know, whatever. It shouldn't even matter. Just be like, you know what, it's wrong, I'm going to get rid of it. Because of what the Bible says, you know, God has the power to help and to cast down. And um, God can help you overcome your sins if you choose wisely. Now, um, Go back to Second Chronicles chapter twenty-five if you if you're not there already. Whatever financial loss you may have to suffer by getting right with God, it's all worth it. Not only is it worth it because of the 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 sin that'll be you know getting out of your life, but God's able to bless you anyways, as we already saw in this chapter. When, when Amaziah asks the man of God, he says, well, what should we do about the hundred talents? In verse 9, he says, um, uh, and Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. God is able to bless you so much more abundantly and be able to provide for you way better. But he, he's looking for your obedience. He's looking for you to do what's right in his eyes. Now, as we see later on in this, in this chapter, sometimes getting right with God can have even more costs than what you're first thinking about. I mean, it's, it's easy to see the, the financial investment in, in something, but you may or may not even be aware of other repercussions or other costs that might come up as a result of your actions, but we don't want to let that 
stop us from doing what's right. Look at verse 13. Now, I don't think that Amaziah knew that this was going to happen because when he sent those children of Ephraim home, you'd think they'd be happy because they got paid and they didn't even have to go out to war. But they actually were offended is what happened. They got offended by the fact that he said, no, no, no. You know, I thought we needed you, but we don't really need you. Go home. And this got them angry. Look at what they did in verse 13. It says, But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even unto Beth Horon, and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. They were ready for war. And they said, Oh, you don't need us? You're going to send us back? So they turned around and attacked them. They attacked Judah. They attacked you know, and, and killed 3,000 of them. Now, I'm sure Amaziah wasn't thinking that they were going to go and do that. But this is an effect or a result of his doing what's right by God. But really what it is, it's not, an, it's not as much an effect of him doing what's right by God as it is an effect of him getting involved in the sin in the first place. See, he never should have gotten involved with the children of Israel because they're, I mean, look at how wicked they are. They can't even just take their money and just say, well, we don't need you anymore and go home. No, they have to do wickedly and turn against them and start killing, you know, 3,000 men. But look at what the alternative would have been. 3,000 or 300,000. They would have lost probably their whole army if they would have kept these guys with them. The cost would have been so much greater at 300,000 lives versus 3,000. Now, it's a shame that these 3,000 men died, obviously. And that's not right. And what, what, what they did was wicked here. And you can't, you can't blame that on Amaziah except for the fact that he got them involved in the first place. So it's not a result of him doing what's right. But what happens though sometimes, and my point with this, is that when you decide to take a stand for God and make these changes, you might end up offending other people. You might end up receiving some kind of blowback from people because of the stance that you start to take. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing this up is not to discourage you because obviously God can do so much more and it's going to be so much better for you anyways to make the right decision. But we need to be aware of this just as something that might happen so it doesn't just, just break you down and get you out of the fight and, and revert you back into, into your sinful ways because of the conflict that might arise from somebody that disagrees with you or someone that might be offended by the things that you do. Sometimes we've already started going down a sinful path before we've decided to make the right decision. And even if you were just ignorant, it doesn't matter, right? Even if you just didn't know at all, just had no idea, right? I had no idea this was wrong. And I already started getting into this, getting involved. But sometimes there's going to be a consequence that will come as a result of us getting right because we already put ourselves in a bad situation to begin with. I mean, think about someone that joins a gang, right? They're young. They get involved in a gang, and that's all they know, but then they want to get out. Getting out of the gang. I mean, depending on the gang, some, you know, they do different things, but sometimes you have to take a severe beating before they'll even let you out. Some of them won't even really let you out. You know, there's all these different things, but, but that's an example of something that, that you can get involved with early on, even ignorantly, and then when you want to do what's right later, it could come with, with a cost, it could come with a consequence. Maybe something a little bit more realistic for the people that are here today. Maybe you're part of some like, you know, a Christian organization for a long time. And then, you know, you discover that they've been deceiving you or they've been wrong and that, and that they've actually not doing good work that you thought they were doing. You, you get involved with someone, you think they're doing a good thing. You think they're helping the cause of Christ. And then you find out, wow, they're actually way backwards and they're not doing what's right. But you might have been involved and deceived yourself for a long time. For example, I mean, even people who have been involved in false religions for a long time. Maybe they were, you know, like the Apostle Paul, he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He thought he was doing God good, but he was actually doing the exact opposite. He was fighting against God. When he was going around and persecuting the church and, and, and um, you know, all the things that he did was contrary to the Word of God. Now, he was ignorant about it. He didn't know. It's not that he knew the gospel and rejected it. He just didn't know the gospel and he was doing what he thought was right. He thought he was doing God's service. But he was ab absolutely wrong. But what happens when he gets out of that and when he gets right? He has a decision to make. Well, you know what? I'm going to receive Christ. He got saved. And he came out of that, that false religion. He came out of that. But that comes with consequences as well. 
Now he's got the people, the, the Pharisees and the people he was tied in with, hate him and want him dead. And that's a result of him having come from, from that, you know, being such a high up in, in that religion. Now they, they are, you know, bringing um, persecution against him. And that can happen with people today as well. I mean, people come out of these cults like the Mormon cult and Jehovah's Witness cult or just any false religion. And then they might have the, the, the backlash of family. Maybe you grow up in a family, your entire family is Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Everybody. And you're going to this church and, hey, you think it's right. You think you're doing what's right by God. You, you don't know the true gospel that you can't you lose your salvation. That once you're saved, you're saved forever. That, that you know, there is no, you know, it, the backslider isn't going to hell. If you're saved, you have the, the spirit of God. You are born again. You're a child of God. You have eternal life. Eternal means forever. But maybe you've been doing this for a long time and your family's involved and, and you, know, you think you're doing a good thing and then you realize, you know what? They're pre preaching a false gospel. Mm -hmm. This is wrong. What's going on here is wrong because people actually go into hell as a result of this effort as opposed to people getting saved because they're not preaching the right gospel. And the Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, I don't want to misquote it, the Apostle Paul says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. It's a big deal. False gospels being preached. Whether it be the Mormons teaching a works-based salvation, the Jehovah's Witnesses preaching a works-based salvation, anybody else preaching a works-based salvation, if it's not salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and that once you receive that gift, you are saved forever, it's a false gospel. Amen. And you might have been ignorant about it in the past, but once you realize, once you see the truth, we have to accept it as God's word and say, you know what, this is right. I need to come out and separate myself from these people. I need to not be involved with that. And... Again, that may come at a cost of family members now ousting you, not inviting you to family events or whatever because they feel like you're a heretic and you're, you know, I can't believe you're outside of the church. And this happens a lot when people get saved and they come out of these, these false religions and now all of a sudden it causes a lot of strife in the family. The bottom line is this. Don't let some kind of investment into something whether it's financially or even just a bunch of your time, be a reason for you not to get right with God. No matter what that investment is, it means nothing. Getting right with God is, is what matters. Amen. I could think, I'm going to close with this, I could think of a certain family that I met a, a, quite a while back at, at Faithful Word when I was attending church there. Good Christian family. Great family. You know, I, I love them. I've, I've even run into them after that. You know, I, I've got nothing against them personally. I think they're, they're, they're nice people. But, they, you know, they, they started coming to church. They loved the hard preaching. They liked that it wasn't watered down. They liked the, the zeal of the church. They liked how people were into soul winning. You know, they, they loved all that. But the, the one thing that stuck with them was that, you know, the pastor was preaching that, the pre-trib rapture was a lie. And that was false. And that we actually have, you know, the Christians will actually go through tribulation before Jesus Christ returns, before God pours out his wrath on this earth. And, you know, that was something that, and, and if I remember correctly, he actually was starting to agree with that position and started to see that what he was believing was false. But the reason why they left even though he, he, he was able to admit that, yeah, you're probably right, I think I'm wrong about this, was because he didn't want to then have to tell his family, because, you know, the man was, was, the, he was the, the spiritual head of the household, as he should have been, and he was teaching his family and everything, but he didn't want to go back to them and say that, hey, everything I've been teaching you about this was wrong, because he, didn't, he said he didn't want their confidence to be shaken in him, that, that they have to question everything that he says now. It's like, well, wait, look. If you're wrong about something, the worst thing you can do is just, is just cover it up and continue. And I mean, if you now know that that's a lie, then why are you going to keep preaching it? Mm -hmm. Just to get somebody's confidence in you. And see, that's the problem. The confidence doesn't have to be 
in me as a man. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in the Word of God. So we all need to be, not to be above correction and be able to say, you know what? I was wrong about this because I don't have every single answer about everything and I'm able to be correct as well. It's just something that he should have been able to do and be able to say, you know what, family? I'm going to tell you this because it's right and this is true. I was wrong about this. And I'm sorry for teaching you what was wrong, but now I see, now I'm not ignorant anymore, and this is true, and this is right. But see, he had all this investment in his family and somehow feeling like he was going to lose their trust or something, which I think is unfounded anyways. I believe your family could still, if you're, if you're doing, you know, if you're living a godly life and being a godly man ahead of the household and you're wrong about something, okay. Just make sure you get it right and show your children that, that what's way more important than, than what people think about me is being right with God. See, he cared more about his family and what they thought about him than what God thought about him. And that's, what we, that's the bottom line. We need to be more concerned about what God thinks about us than what man thinks about us or anyone else for that matter. Uh, when, when I was getting right with God, I went through some radical changes. In a, in a short period of time. But that's kind of the way I am. You know, I got saved when I was 20, but I lived a really worldly life, and, and I wasn't ready to, for some stupid reason, I was, wasn't like ready to go into church. But I knew, even, I remember even thinking, a while before I had gotten right with God, thinking that, you know what, I want to, I need to get back in church. I know I need to get back. I know I need to get, get right with God. And I started contemplating in my head, thinking, well, if I get right with God, that means, you know, I'm not going to have anything to do with this person and this person. Mm -hmm. Because I already knew that they, you know, I was wicked. I already knew that I shouldn't have been hanging out with them, but I was. And I never mentioned Jesus Christ. I never did anything, but I was thinking to myself, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to have to do all these different things. I'm going to have to make all these changes in my life. I'm going to get right with God. And it was, it was like, I mean, this is the, the thought process that was going on in my head. And at that time, I didn't do it. But then later on, I did get right with God. But when I got right with God, it was, you know, I was not lukewarm, I'll tell you that much. Because everything that I saw, I was just, and, and some things I already knew were wrong, but I was deliberately doing them because I was living in the flesh and walking in the flesh, and that's extremely wicked and wrong. But once you got right with God, it was this is gone, this is gone, let's clean, you know, clear this stuff out, purge all this sin. And even my roommate at the time was kind of like, you know, man, what's wrong with you? And he, you know, he, was, he was even saying like, well, you didn't have to destroy that stuff, why didn't you just give it to me? Mm -hmm. I was just like, no, you know, and, and this, is, this is what needed to be done. And um, I wasn't worried about what he was going to think of me. I wasn't worried about what other people were thinking. I was worried about what God thought. And I knew that God would have wanted me to destroy this stuff. God doesn't want it part of anybody's life, and He wanted it gone. And we need to have, maintain that same type of an attitude. Let's do what's right in God's eyes. Amen. Let's not worry about what, other, what family's going to think, what friends are going to think, what other church members are going to think. Let's do what's right as we see in the Bible. And as you get... Convicted of it as you see things in the Bible, as you, as you are, are faced and confronted with truths that, that confront your own personal sin, do what's right by God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for this story where we see the decisions that need to be made. Dear God, I pray that you would please help us all to make the right decision to serve you and um, to do what's right in your sight, dear Lord, and that we wouldn't take care for the the financial cost or the, even the relationship cost that might result of us doing the right thing and getting sin out of our life, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please strengthen us and help us to do those things which are right in your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.